1 Corinthians chapter 10, learn from the past. Learn from the mistakes of the past. Let us be wise enough not to repeat the failures of the past. And that's my theme for today. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The subject matter has not changed. Chapter 10 is Paul's concluding remark on the same subject matter. Exercise self-control. Watch your conduct. Do not do anything that would stumble your weaker brother in the faith. And today, he's going to address in his closing remark, do not stumble into sin yourself. Paul makes his concluding remarks here in chapter 10, still on the same subject of exercising self-control and not becoming a stumbling block to others. We have our rights, we have our freedom in Christ, but watch our conduct because not everything we do is beneficial. In the preceding section covered by Brother Lester last week, Paul emphasizes the importance of self-control, of self-discipline in the Christian life. Runners and boxers in the Korean games discipline themselves, but only to strive for a perishable wreath for a crown, no doubt. That's the price, but perishable. But for us, doing the work of God, we are called to have self-control, strict discipline, because we are working for God for a price. The Word of God says that is in ESV version, imperishable. NIV version puts it, lasting forever. So NIV puts it eternal, ESV puts it imperishable. And that's the price we are striving for, which is eternal and imperishable. Therefore, the need to exercise self-control. It takes self-control, it takes a lot of hard work, but we want to do it. Why? Because we want to finish the race and gain the prize. We want to win the prize of hearing our Lord Jesus saying to us one day, well done, well done, good and faithful servant, when we see him again in heaven. Hence, Paul says we do not want to run this race aimlessly. We do not want to be like a boxer, boxing, beating the air fruitlessly. We want to discipline ourselves and achieve something worthwhile, something very significant in the light of eternity. And so today, Paul concludes in our text today, chapter 10, the first part, with a stern warning, again on the exercise of self-control, the exercise of the Corinthians' freedom in Christ. He returned to the subject matter at hand, and that is the insistence by some Corinthians on the freedom that they have in attending the pagan feast in the temple. They claim that, well, I'm just there to eat the meat, not to worship the idol. Well, the meat is nothing since they are offered to nothing, and so I'm there to eat the meat and not worship either. So I am, I'm free to do it. Now, earlier we have already covered in chapter 8, 9, Paul stressing the need to restrain ourselves, to control ourselves for the sake of our weaker brother in the faith and also for the sake of a testimony of the gospel. So I have my rights and freedom, but I'm not going to use it. Now he's going to warn them. He's going to warn them of the danger of eating in this feast. So he raised two reasons. We are going to cover two parts of chapter 10. First part, verses 1 to 13. Watch out for the danger of exposing yourself to temptation. That's the trust of the first part. The second part, verses 14 to 22, which will be covered by Deacon Michael. 
is that such a conduct is incompatible with the Christian life. So today I'm going to cover the first part. The danger of exposing yourself to temptation around you. Paul cites the lesson from Israel history. So you will read a lot of recounting of Israel failures of the past as warning for them today. So let's read verse 1 to 13. Chapter 10, verse 1 to 13. Verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers, our forefathers, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6. Now, these things took place as example for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. It's a quotation from Exodus 32. Verse 8. Do not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. Verse 9. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpent. Verse 10, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, verse 12 says, Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Verse 13, No temptation has taken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Twice, Paul says that this has happened as an example in this whole text, right? Two times you see this. This has happened as an example. And twice he says they are written down. They are written down, of course, for us, the readers in the generation after them. What has happened in the past now serve as examples for us. Paul stressed that in verse 6 and in verse 11. Look at your Bible and you see that word. Now these things took place as examples for us. And verse 11, now these things happen to them as an example. So the past is not useless. The past are not just bygones. Our past teaches us. Right, and make us wiser if we learn from them. God uses the history of Israel. God uses His dealings with His people in history. God uses the past, the past experiences, particularly their failures, to teach and warn this generation, like the Corinthians now, of the consequences of making the same mistake and the folly of repeating them because they will experience the same judgment and the consequences of God's discipline. Israel has experienced God's blessing and privileges right from the beginning. And yet a fair share of their failures and sinful mistakes down through the history. And now they are written for us to learn. And then the second word I want to stress from Paul is, it is written. 
Twice he said that. Verse 7, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, then he quoted Exodus 32. The people sat down and ate and drink and rose up to play. Now, where this line come from? It comes from Exodus 32, verse 6, the last part of verse 6. And the context, the context of this line, they were actually in idolatry. Moses was up on Mount Sinai and he took too long to come down. And so Aaron gathered the people, they collect all the jewelry and then they make this golden calf. And on the day when this golden calf was kind of launched, they were celebrating, they were having this great party. And, and 32, Exodus 32, verse 5 and 6 tells us, when Aaron saw this golden calf, he built an altar before the calf and proclaimed to the people, come, come, tomorrow there shall be a feast to the Lord, that Lord. So the next day, they, they arose and offered burnt offerings and present peace offering, and the people sat down to eat and drink and got to indulge in reverie. And that's the line that Paul quoted. That means they, they were tempted into sin, into idolatry. And then again in verse 11, the word that I want to stress is written down. Verse 11, Now this thing happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Now, this is, this is something we need to hold on to. God has inspired people to pen down the encounters of Israel uh, in the Old Testament and, of course, later on, the experiences of those who have come to know Christ in the New Testament. God has written them down, not just as historical records, they are divinely inspired scriptures for our instruction. They are words and acts of God meant for us to learn and understand God, to gain an understanding of who God is and His will for us. And that's why when Paul wrote to Timothy, he summed it up very well in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scriptures is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. I will come to understand God's heart and God's will for me through the scriptures. And so God's dealing with Israel has been written down for our instruction. And so we are going to learn from them, we are going to learn from their past failures and not repeat them. And so, Paul argues against the practice of visiting the temple and participating in all the pagan feasts by drawing lessons from the past. You are exposing yourself to temptation. And so, he wants to counter the prideful Corinthians who claim that, well, I'm there only to eat the meat and I'm okay, I'm very strong and I will not fall and I will not worship the idol. And so Paul highlighted the past, the idolatry of their forefathers and, and the many times they have fallen. And so now I'm going to list down all the, the few failures that he, he quoted from history. The first one is a lesson from the forefathers. The forefathers failed God. The forefather experienced God's deliverance, remarkable deliverance from their bondage in Egypt. And listen to how Paul described that. He said they were delivered, they were delivered through the sea by Moses. And the way Paul described it, he's trying to describe it as a type of baptism. It's like our experience of salvation today. When we come to know Christ, we are, we are baptized. Look at them. They were delivered from their sinful past, from their bondage in Egypt, through the sea, as if it's a type of baptism. And like all of them, the Corinthians, you come to know Christ, you're baptized, right? You're free from your bondage of sin. He uses this to prefigure the conversion that we are experiencing today. And our forefathers, he went on, he quote a second picture, second picture, a type for for the Corinthians to understand. Our forefathers, they were sustained in the wilderness. They would have died, actually, 
if not for a supernatural provision by God, right? And so, so he says, they were sustained in the wilderness. Why? Because God provided manna and water for them supernaturally. Now, so all of them, he says, ate the spiritual food and drank the spiritual drink. And then he says, do you know that this experience actually points forward to the rock, to the rock which is Christ? And so he's trying to tell them that their experience prefigures that salvation that God is going to ultimately bring about. Not a physical deliverance from Egypt, but our deliverance from sin eventually. Again, Paul uses a picture, right? You see here, that prefigures to me the Lord's Supper. So we, we are participating in the Holy Communion. The Corinthians are participating in the Lord's Supper. They are eating and drinking, remembering Christ as their Saviour, remembering their experience of salvation. And so he's trying to use this picture to illustrate that they experience God's salvation through the sea and through divine sustenance. Just like us, we experience, we claim that we experience God's salvation today because our faith in Jesus Christ, we are baptized, and now we are all taking the Holy Communion, remembering Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yet, he says, despite all of these experiences, yet, despite their great deliverance and the blessing they had, our forefathers turned their backs on God. <laughs> Nevertheless, they rebelled against God. And God declared, that they will not enter the land of Canaan. In fact, God decreed that they will all perish. That first generation will all perish in the wilderness. And this is what God says. The Lord says in Numbers 14, verses 21 to 23. But truly, I as I live, and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have Seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despise me shall see it. And that's why Paul concluded, right, in verse 5, nevertheless, despite all the great experiences of God's deliverance. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Our Bible says, verse 5, ESV version. NIV version put it more bluntly. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. NIV version says. They perished in the wilderness because of unbelief. So don't think you stand. He was warning the Corinthians that you're very spiritual, that you have gone through the baptism, that you are now taking the Holy Communion, and that you're very fine. You will not fall into temptation. You will not sin against God. Don't think that way. Look at our forefathers. This is Paul's warning. Expressed very well in verse 12, actually. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So do not be presumptuous, he's telling the Corinthians. Don't think that you go to the pagan feast, nothing will happen to you, you're fine, you're very spiritual, you're very strong, you'll keep to God's will and law. Don't think that you will not be tempted, don't think that you will not fall into idolatry. You can have wonderful experiences in the past, external experiences, uh, like the baptism, like the, the Lord's Supper, and yet be tempted into idolatry. You look at our forefathers. The external experiences do not automatically translate to faith in God. The external riches, the external experiences that we have do not automatically translate to faith in God. The baptism and the spiritual food and drink did not keep the forefathers from ultimately rebelling against God. They failed. 
to gain the price of entering the land of Canaan. No self-control. No self-discipline. And that end up in them perishing in the wilderness. And so Paul went on, as if that's not enough, Paul went on to list four more examples of their failures. And it's very nice. Every verse has one. Verse 7, you look at verse 7, 8, 9, 10. 7, the idolaters. Don't be the idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Well, this one we quoted just now. The context is that they make this golden calf and they all celebrated in worship of the Lord. They call it Lord, the calf. The context is very clear. Aaron led the people into idolatry. And so when he returned, what happened actually when Moses returned? When Moses returned to the foot of the mount and saw this episode right taking place, he ordered God's judgment upon the people as the Lord so directed him. So he ordered the Levites to kill 3,000 men on that day. Verse 8, sexual immorality, the second failure that he highlighted from history. They indulged in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. And that context is in Numbers 25, verses 1 to 9. Now, I won't have time to go into the, the whole story, but, but they were, they were worshipping Baal of Peor. They created an idol. They were worshipping that idol. And before that idol, they were indulging in sexual immorality. And that's Numbers 25. And God sent a plague to judge them. And that plague that day killed 24,000 people. Paul mentioned 23,000. It could be uh, a situation where Paul record wrongly. It's very close, but he record 23,000. So according to the scriptures in Numbers 25, it's 24,000. And then the number three failure, they put God to the test. Verse 9, we must not put God to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpent. They put God to the test. But yet, Paul prefigures Christ in already. So he says, they put Christ, the future Christ, to the test. Because that experience prefigures the salvation that Christ is going to bring about. They are going to look up to the bronze serpent and be saved. Now that's the context in Numbers 21. This is the third example of Israel's failure to obey God. And so in Numbers 21, they were complaining because they have no food, they have no water, and then they hated the manna. And so poisonous serpent came out and killed many until God asked Moses to make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And all who looked to it lived. That's God's mercy. Paul was inferring that the Corinthians must not put Christ to the test by eating at his table, the Lord's Supper, and eating at the table of demons in the temples. If you are a Christian, boasting about your standing before God, you are eating at the Lord's table, you are eating at the demons' table. Verse 10, the fourth one, the fourth example. No grumble. And that is a famous situation that we know. They grumble many times, but I believe there is two very serious uh, situations that is highlighted. So we do not know which one is he talking about because Paul says they grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. So both times happens in Numbers 14 and Numbers 16. The context in Numbers 14 is that they explored the land, they came back, and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You shouldn't have brought us here to die. How can you bring us here just to die here? 
you know why they are afraid of going in? Because of the giants that they saw. So the whole congregation gang up together uh, with the ten spies with great unbelief and they challenged Aaron and Moses. I would rather die in Egypt, they say in uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. I would rather have died in Egypt or die here in the wilderness. You want to send us to be slaughtered in that land? (laughs) And so because of this great unbelief and their rebellion, God pronounced judgment on them that they will not enter Canaan. The other situation in number 16 is when when Korah, Korah is a Levite, Korah and a gang of his followers come and challenge Moses and Aaron. In fact, they organize a revolt, actually. He organized an a uprising, and they come and challenge uh, Moses and Aaron. You know, when they challenge Moses and Aaron, God stepped in to judge. Uh, this one is a miraculous judgment. The land opened up and swallowed them in. And because of that, the people grumble. Hey, two of you kill these Levites. How can you kill the people of God? And that's the grumbling that comes from the people. And the Lord sent a plague. That's the destroyer that Paul uses, right? God sent a plague. And so the plague was sweeping through the people who rebelled against God. And God showed mercy again. Moses asked Aaron, quickly go get a censer and, uh, and burn incense and run to the people. That's a symbol of prayer, prayer of mercy, of atonement. So Aaron went to get a censer, uh, put incense, and he ran to the people. The, the account is in Numbers chapter 16, 47 to uh, 49. So Aaron took the censer, and, and the plague has already been moving among the people, and people are falling under the plague. He put the incense and made atonement for the people. So he ran into the midst of the people, and he stood between the dead and the living. So at the point when he ran into it, because he's praying for God's atonement, he's pleading for God's atonement, and so God relented, right? So he ran in between the people, and so you have one side, people falling, all dead, and the other side, of course, living, still living because of his burning incense. And so he's standing between the living and the dead, and the plate stopped, and the plate stopped. And now those who died in the plate was 14,700, besides those who died in the affair of Korah and the Levites. So now, he draw his conclusion now, Paul, verse 11. So having tell you all this example, this four example, it says, now he draws his uh, warning example to a close and said in verse 11, now, this thing has happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. That's us. For our instruction. And then, His lesson is, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Behind all this happening lies the eternal purposes of God, who knows the end from the beginning and has ordained all of this to be recorded in the Scriptures for our instruction. And therefore, we want to read it We want to understand the words of God and the works of God so that we will obey Him and live a life that is of great blessing. And this is the reason why Paul holds the Scripture in high regard. And the same for us today. Why are we always talking about what the Bible says? Because we have to hold it in high regard. According to the reason that is very plainly stated here by Paul, that God had inspired his people to pen down the works of God and the works of God so that people like us today will understand him and know him. 
So they are not just historical records. It is the message of God to a lost world. We are convicted of that. We believe that. Therefore, Paul says, with all of this lesson from the past, he urges the Corinthians to exercise self-control and not be proud, not be presumptuous, don't be complacent, don't go to the temple always and just eat with them in the pagan feast. Let anyone who thinks that he stand take heed lest he fall. So there's, there's no immunity. There's no immunity from temptation, right? Whether you're a pastor, you're a, a Christian for 10 years, 20 years, whatever status you think that you might have, there's no immunity from temptation for anyone. Not even Christians who are baptized and taking the Holy Communion. Not even for our forefathers who have went through the sea and sustained supernaturally by the manna and by the drink from the rock. There's no special privileges, no immunity. No one is exempt from sin. That's a warning. We are all vulnerable, we are all susceptible to temptation and to sin. Hence, be careful, Paul says. Take heed, take heed. Be careful. Exercise self-control. That's the trust still. So flee from idolatry. That's the next line, right? Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. That's the punchline. Now, this is a very heavy, serious uh, note, right? Just before he closes, his words of warnings, Paul wanted to encourage the people. So he injected one more line. Before verse 14 comes, he injected one more line. Verse 13, which is the line we all like. It's a famous line. He injected a, a word of encouragement. He does not want to end with all of this warning uh, with a very heavy heart, with a very serious word of threat. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Beautiful. Temptation cannot win us, frankly. If we don't allow it, we do not need to succumb to it because we have the promise of divine aid. God is in our life. We have the promise of God's help. Our faithful God, He says. He's faithful. You may have departed from Him, he has not departed from you. Our faithful God is there to help us at least in two ways, Paul says. One, He will not let us be tempted beyond our ability to bear. Number two, and with the temptation, even if it comes, God will also provide a way of escape. The last time I say this, so that we may be able to endure it. In other words, there's a time, right? It's not immediate, no. Sometimes there's this trial, this temptation that's there, and it's always like a fight, and it's, it's lingering, and for some time. Because there's this enduring that you may be able to endure it. So there's this enduring going on, this fight going on, this testing going on, this persevering, you, you exercise self-control, you are persevering, there's this period of time when you are enduring, but His promise is, God is there to see you through it and win it. You can win it not because you are great, you can win it because you have a great God, a faithful one who is there for you. We can pass the test. Why? Because we have divine aid. Our faith is not in our ability to win the temptation. Our faith is in His ability 
to help us flee from it. Let me say that again. Our faith is not in our ability to stand the temptation. Our faith is in the ability of God to help us flee. And that's why he keeps telling the Corinthians, don't, don't go to the temple, enjoy this pagan feast, thinking that you're fine, you're exposing yourself to temptation. And next week, that is not a conduct of a Christian. And that's the topic for next week. So let me close today with two lessons that I can learn from the words of Paul. One is learn from the past. We will fail. We will fall. We will sin. That's common to everybody, including pastors. But learn. Learn from the past and gain wisdom. Don't waste the past. Don't waste the past. Don't dwell on the past. Don't live in the past. Don't regret the past. If you can learn from it as good instruction, according to Paul, don't regret the past. Just learn from it. Learn from what God has done in your life. Learn from it and be a wiser person today so that in the future, I can live a life of great obedience to God because I've learned the lesson of the past. So take the lesson that we have learned and apply them today. Understand why things have happened the way they did and then use the knowledge that you have gained, the understanding, understanding that we have of God and His will so that today we can make the right decision to honour Him and live for Him. Look at what God has done. Understand His will and honour Him today. That's the lesson that we can learn. Look at how God deals with Israel and obey Him today. And then number two, still the same thread from chapter 8 all the way down to chapter 10. Watch your conduct. Watch your conduct and exercise self-control. There are a lot of things we can do because we have the rights, we have the freedom in Christ. But I told you at the beginning, not everything is beneficial. Watch your conduct and exercise self-control. Set boundaries. Set boundaries. Keep away from temptation. Don't enter it and tell yourself to win it. Flee from temptation, the scripture says. Eat your meat somewhere else. If you love to eat the meat, eat your meat somewhere else. Not at the pagan temples. No one is immune from temptation. No one is exempt from sin. The one who thinks he's immune have already sinned to me. The one who thinks that he's immune has already sinned. Pride. And so the fall is coming. So let's really honour God. Pray that the Lord will continue to teach us we learn from our failures, we learn from our past, we gain God's wisdom, we understand His will, we seek God's help. He promises us that He will be in our life and that He will help us. Even with the temptation right before us, there is still a way of escaping it. So we lean on Him and let's honour Him with all our hearts. Let's pray. We want to thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is our light, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It shows us your way. It reveals your heart for us. We come to understand your will. And so help us, Lord, to walk in it. Pray, Lord, that we will not be complacent. We will not play with fire and expect not to be burned. We will watch our conduct. We will exercise self-control. We will do whatever we can, Lord, to stay holy and righteous before you. Help us do your will and glorify your name. This we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.